Boom, 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 literature gets a look. Let's talk about books. And welcome back to Legs Talk About Books, the occasional podcast where we talk about books. I'm, of course, Hard Leg Joe, joined once again by my perennial co-host, CB Radio. Year is 40,000 some some... There is nothing but but war. war. It is a grim, dark future. Yeah, something like that. And, uh, yeah, welcome back. Hello, everyone. Or hello, new people who didn't know that this this used to be a monthly podcast. And then, and then in 2022, we kind of just like, eh, we yeah. got busier things to do. This podcast isn't that big. But then we got a Patreon request from one Mr. Zero1503. Thank you for re- that. Who requested us to read The Infinite and the Divine by Robert Rath. Mm-hmm. Which is quite an interesting name for someone writing in the the Warhammer 40k. It universe. almost sounds like a a non de plume for that. I, I assume it probably is. Though I would say, uh, if you guys do want to uh, have us read any more books, yeah, please do. Just yeah, Patreon. I mean that's an option if you want to join the Patreon. The Patreon's mostly for my my Yu Gi Oh channel. Mm-hmm. You know, but uh, I have a I have an episode request here at fifty dollars. If you join that, you can request a book, and I will I will read that book. Just not spring snow. And yeah, not as long spring- as it's somewhat appropriate, as long as it's something that we're like kind of in our wheelhouse. I just say not spring snow. Just not spring snow again. <laughs> no, we're not going to read the same book again. I don't want to do it again. What it is, or or anything similar, hopefully. But Warhammer 40K was kind of in our wheelhouse. I mean, it's science fiction fantasy. Yeah. We've read mostly fantasy books on here. We've, we've gone a little bit out of that. But, you know, this is this is something that, that we would be interested in. So I figured, go ahead and give it a try. And uh, we should note that neither of us really knew a whole lot about 40K going into this. I had some prior knowledge. I'd watched a bunch of, like, lore videos. I haven't played anything or anything like that. I just... And I had a friend that talked about it all the time, but my knowledge of the in-depth stuff of it was uh, about as shallow as a pond, really. All I knew was blood for the blood god, skulls for the skull throne. I had a very, very uh, loose idea of, like, I think there's an emperor, and he's, like, in a big golden chair, and Mm -hmm. he, like, makes FTL travel possible, and he's, like, dead, but not... And I think that's about it. That's all I knew. Space Marines. Space Marines, and I thought it was a lot more grimdark. I had no idea it could be as silly as, as this is. Well, it's kind of that idea of, like, if it were grim grimdark all the time, I don't think it would have been as popular as it is. Because you have to have some grimdark and then some ridiculous stuff in there to make you be like, ha ha, now I'm st- I stopped crying. It's all right. It's good. Hard to say. It really does seem like half the people I've met who are into 40k are the, you know, oh, I really like the brutal, realistic fantasy of it. And the other half are like, yes, drive me forward. I want to stab it with my sword. Yes. This one was actually very, very silly. Um, I wouldn't say very silly, but it's definitely on that that intersecting point between grim, dark, and silly. I mean, you do have, like... 10,000-year-old robots and the ennui of losing a soul and the entire destruction of civilizations being witnessed over the course of millennia. There's a very intense game of, I'm going to knock it over. Yeah. <laughs> that happens. It starts off this entire thing. Um, but, yeah, like, the, I would say it's very silly just compared to what I was expecting out of, yeah. uh, out of the few things that I've, like, read and I have watched a short story turned into an animation of it. And, yeah, it's very, like, everything is grim, dark, everything's sad. And in this one, it's just like, hey, can you tell him to stop touching me? <laughs> can we legally make it so he's not allowed to touch me anymore? <laughs> I would prefer that. For me, it was like, you know, it, this isn't even spoilers just in the first chapter, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, this this grim guy talking about the heart of a dying earth, and he's stealing this ancient relic. Um, and then the natives are trying to stop him, and the natives are like, magical space elves riding velociraptors and shooting shurikens out of a shotgun yeah <laughs> it, it's very this is this is a, a book that doesn't it shows the more absurd instead of silly i'd say on, on a lot of this at stuff. least the, the first part like it didn't catch catch me at first how silly it was because they treat it respectfully right mm-hmm. they're not making fun of the fact that they're on giant raptors it just sort of treated as oh this is a threat that i have to deal with now these dinosaur people 
Um, it isn't until the orcs show up about halfway through when I'm like, oh, oh, this is clown shoes. Oh, mm-hmm. I understand now. Well, okay, the orcs themselves in all of 40k are the moment where you're like, oh, and we've put on the clown shoes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now now this is a parody. This is a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy more than it is, like, dark Star Trek. You have, like, the Necrons that are just, like, the Necron tier. The, the ones with their soul stolen. And then you have the orcs, which are, like... Uh, this one's called a fly get, and, <laughs> and, and this one's called a tech boy. Hey there, boys, let's go crunch it up there, right? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, that's the moment where in 40k where you're just like, somebody took a bong riff somewhere. Yeah, it's a very interesting universe. Um, we, we probably shouldn't go on and on about the universe, because mm. that's something we'll talk about a little bit later. If you're unfamiliar with the show or, or, or new to the show, usually what we do is we start with some spoiler-free thoughts, recommendation, sort of like a rating, and then from there we go into either assuming you've read the book or you're not going to read the book and you don't care, and then we just jump into the discussion. So as far as spoiler-free thoughts, I feel like I've dominated this discussion quite a bit. So why don't you start? What, how would you rate this book without giving any sort of spoilers? Um, I would rate it about a, a 7 out of 10, just because it's not what I was expecting out of 40k, and it shows me how 40k can be an interesting world other than uh, somebody smacking you with a heavy metal guitar for five minutes. Yeah. And just being like, check out my metal posters. Like, okay, fine, fine, I get it. More blood for the blood god. The the the, the god emperor is a skeleton upon his golden throne. Cool. You like metal. And this <laughs> one, this book was very much like, hey, check out these really like dope fantasy ideas, and then we're gonna put on the most funny and stupid thing that these two characters could be doing. What, what if they fought? Yeah. What, what if, if they? They're they're definitely it's not, part. It's not so much. What if they fought? It's like what if they fought in the most juvenile way they could possibly do I don't know, it, it, there are definitely parts of this book that have the feel of like guys with action figures like clashing them together like, oh that's what if the... this happened this this whole book is filled with fight scenes mm-hmm. it seems almost to be like a series of fight scenes strung together they introduce all the races every race gets a chance to fight for whatever reason i think somewhat maybe there's a couple of them that aren't yeah, but most of them, like, they have an excuse to put, work them into the story and mm-hmm. have them in there. And you really do get the idea that, like, whoever wrote this was a fan of the tabletop game and really kind of wanted to bring some of those to life and show them off. One of the things that we had been asked to talk about was the perspective of someone who doesn't know 40k. Like, is this a good introduction? Does it get you into the 40k universe? And I'm not sure if it would be a good introduction like you could definitely understand it without knowing much about 40k but it feels in a lot of ways more like an advertisement for the universe i would say like um from your perspective since you're the person who came into it flat like almost blind almost blind yeah but from somebody who's like if you're if you've been dabbling with 40k where you're just like uh I've, i've seen some videos and a friend of mine talks about it constantly. I like to ask him about it or something like that. This is a... I would say this is a great introduction to, like... Uh, to having your own slice of 40K. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, ta- it takes... Like you said, it introduces almost every race. Uh, if not every. And it yeah. introduces somewhat the perspective of almost all of them. And it gives you this very uh, organic feel of each of the... Uh, like, what what each of the places are so yeah i it's one of those like i said i I think it feels more like an advertisement in a way Mm -hmm. which i don't mean to disparage it because you know this is a licensed book it's meant to make you interested in 40k Mm -hmm. and it, it definitely did that it's just when they go into like the battles right They'll start talking about ships and troop names and stuff like that. They list off a whole bunch of things, and they kind of vaguely describe them. But, like, I didn't know the Aldari were supposed to be elves until after the book was over. And I went and looked it up, and it was like, oh, okay, that makes sense with how they described it. But they don't explicitly tell you a lot. They do a really good job of telling you just enough that you want to be like, Okay, so what's a scythe reaver? I need to figure that out. Like, you, you hear about a gargant in briefly, and you're like, okay, what the fuck is that? Because it sounds like an orc mech. Do the orcs have mechs in this series? Mm. And the answer is kind of. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like, 
everything else I'd already I had some like previous knowledge of like I knew that the Eldari were elves and all these little, tiny little things but I, I did find the orcs to be the easiest to be like so what is this oh the name's there oh yeah. it's, it's a tech boy it's a hurt boy like oh, I get it I understand that they make an idea mm-hmm. but it's just a thing where they they give you enough detail that while I was reading this it was really difficult not to go to a wiki to start to look some of this up which I feel is like That's almost a detriment to the book because you kind of need a wiki to understand everything. Mm-hmm. But if the point is to make you read the wiki and be like, oh, that's cool, I want to learn more about that, then it succeeded in what it set out to do. So when are you getting your figures? <laughs> I'm not. I, I, I We'll get to that later. But the 40K <laughs> universe, it's fun. It's a fun place to visit. I don't think I'd like to stay there. No. Oh, God, no. If- if there were any, like, fictional universe to be, like, if they gave me any other option than 40k, I would take it. I, I, I don't mean stay there, like, literally. I mean, I don't want it to become a hobby of mine. Oh, yeah, okay. It's not something I'm going to be reading a whole bunch of 40k books. I might be uh, delving a little bit into it, but not as much as, say, somebody who, like, plays the board game and the video games. I just have a friend who, again, had five recommendations for me after I said I enjoyed the book. Yeah. So if, if you know anything about me, you know that my rating system, I don't really use like general numbers. It's more about like, what were the goals of the book and did they accomplish it? And the goals of this book seem to be tell you about 40k races, show you a bunch of cool fights, and maybe have a little bit of a theme, you know? Mm-hmm. Something about like universes and the way that societies rise and fall, maybe a little bit of, you know the wheel of time turns and the ages come to pass, leaving behind legends that become memories. They kind of literally do that at the end. <laughs> they do. It, it, yeah. we'll, we'll get to that later. Yeah. But my point is, if that's what they wanted to do, then this is like a 10 out of 10. Yeah. Because they accomplish everything they want. The real question is, what are you looking for in a book? Do you just want a fun little adventure romp with some neat sci-fi um, concepts and the ability to see a new universe? Or do you want something with a little more depth into it? If Yeah, if you're that first one, you another 10 out of 10. Personally, there were a lot of times with the fight scenes where I was just like, eh, kind of skimming through the fight scenes, not really paying attention. I'm like, it doesn't really matter who wins or lose. I couldn't get super invested as long as the outcome. Like, you know, who won at the end? What happened? Did we learn anything? There's a couple fights where it's like, and nothing of value or interest happened. Basically, you could have replaced it with, you know, this guy stole the thing again, and he unleashed some orcs. And instead, you get to listen to the whole battle, which mm-hmm. if you if you liked battles, hey, there you go. But I was kind of battled out by the end of this. Yeah, yeah I will say that, that there are a lot of times where it's just like, uh, I would like to hear more about the characters. And yeah, they've, they've <laughs> and just... instead, they're spending so long on the battle, which again, I, I cannot discount the book for it mm-hmm. that's what it was trying to do it's based off war games it, it would be a disservice if they didn't have like literal war games playing out like different scenarios and stuff but that's it's just not what i'm personally interested in mm-hmm. but i think that's enough for the spoiler free area i think we should start moving into the spoiler territories oh uh, yeah i think we could do that so yeah again if this sounds at all interesting to you go ahead go out and read it we you have our recommendation if that mm-hmm. sounds like something you'd like go for it very well written fairly short too how long was the audiobook again it was only like 13 hours so you could knock it out either in like a full day or an afternoon yeah like half the time of a wheel of time album oh yeah yeah or not album <laughs> audiobook rather we should well, say I have the wheel of time on vinyl now oh, on vinyl exciting. Oh. You can hear um, the pops. How, how was the voices on that, by the way? Did, you said they did do a little bit of, like, voice acting? It was one guy, and the guy did it great. He had, like, a voice for the infinite character, and he had a voice for the divine character. And he was... he They, they felt distinctly different, even though they had the same accent. Ah, nice. So it was really good. And did they, they do the, like, the Cockney accent for the orcs and oh, stuff? Oh, God, yes. A few yeah. times they... Okay. Yeah. That's why it was one of my favorite chapters when they did actually get into the, like, have, like, a perspective of an orc. And I'm like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of want more orcs from this guy. <laughs> anyway, let's go ahead and get into spoilers. Starting with 01503, who again requested this. Thank you. I, for some reason, thought that was the date. No. no I'm like, 01503. You know, I never thought about it because the way he writes it, it's like he writes out the word zero. 
and then it's all numbers 1503. Mm-hmm. So I didn't really catch on, but yeah, his whole name is just numbers. It's, mm-hmm. it's just numbers. But uh, the, he had a couple questions he wanted to ask, and since he requested it, we must answer. Compelled are we uh, not. So he says, what, what do you think of the 40K setting in general? And again, I'll leave that over to you first. Um, like we said before, uh, the the universe is very grimdark. It's very savage. But this actually gives us this feeling of, uh, like, ridiculousness. So it, it kind of, it's given me a bit more of a... A, f- a coloration to this it was like before it was very much like everything's intensive red and black and white and all stuff and now it's like here's some funny sh- to be thrown into the corner yeah. there <laughs> just a couple little neat interesting things there's other stuff going on mm-hmm. yeah i will say it's it's definitely more interesting than i expected it to be yes uh but i think it definitely suffers from like a cohesion problem oh yeah uh, there it, you can tell that this is a universe that not one person built it's something that a lot of people have piled on, and it's changed over time quite substantially. You do gotta have you do have to deal with the my character is better than your character thing. Yeah, and... it, it's different things to different people, mm-hmm. and it also I don't know it, it has this interesting trait right of the Necrons as a whole are a very out there scientific concept, like a whole race that gave up their souls to be put into machine bodies that are effectively immortal um, by some sort of weird godlike beings that recruited them to fight another god. And then they turned around and then killed their own god, so they had no gods, no masters. And the freaky part for me is, like, yeah, they turned their old gods into... Power sources. I'm like, okay, all right, you've lost me on that, that, that part. That seems a little bit dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, and they're, they're this, this absolutely, like, ancient race, right? Like, millions and billions of years before humanity even was, like, started, they already had an empire that rose and then fell again. Yeah, they, their souls had been lost a thousand years before the first primate even moved on our planet type thing. Yeah. Um, and yet, at the same time, they are very, very human-like. Yes, and um, childish. And very, ch- very yeah. childish. Just, it's good because the characters are really relatable. Mm. But it, it's um, it's kind of a detriment, at least to me, in, in the universe. Because I've always been a fan of, like, if aliens do exist, they should be completely different from humans. Their experience would be so widely different that like it'd be almost impossible to completely understand them. I really liked in Mass Effect, like, the jellyfish creatures and the big four-legged ones that use, like, pheromones. Like, Mm -hmm. the really, really alien ones. I think you do get that with, uh, I believe we're past the spoiler-free part. Yeah, we're on spoilers. When when you get into the one, the single, uh, not Zerg, but the, uh... (laughs) They are basically the Zerg. I can never remember their names. It starts uh, with a T, I Tyranids. believe. Tyranids. Yeah. You get into the one Tyranid gene splicer's thoughts, and you're just, they're very, very alien. Like, we must for the hive. Yeah. We must for this. We must for that. And it's like, but to survive, to run is life. And we're like, okay, that seems like a very tiring life. Good, good Very with you. much so. And it, yeah, you do get a very alien part, but the Necrons, I feel like since they are a fully sentient and sapient on their own race... I think that's the... Yeah, the thing about the Necrons is that they feel like a a different culture of humans mm-hmm. rather than a different alien race. Like, the Necrons almost feel like something that could exist in, like, a wheel of time just over the horizon. Like, yeah. oh yeah, we find these people and they're, like, effectively immortal because of magic shenanigans. But they're still people at the end of the day. But I also don't think that Warhammer is trying to break the mold of storytelling or... Well, not storytelling, but break the mold of, like, the... Uh, how the these characters perceive things. Yeah. The thing that I definitely would say that they broke the mold on is how... How I perceive immortality. It was a fascinating thing. Just every time that... my One of my favorite things that they kept doing was just like... Somebody would ask a question to a room full of people. And then there would be a pause. And then there would be a cut in of... That pause lasted three years. Yeah. Like, that was the... That's the middle of a sentence. Yeah. Time means nothing to them. We'll get to the time later. Mm-hmm. I still I still have a little bit more oh, okay, about okay. the 40K universe I wanted to say. Because, again, it's you bring up the good point that, like, I don't think that's what they were trying to go for to make mm. this unique thing. But that's just what appeals to me, right? Yep. Uh, I would either prefer this if the Necrons were just another type of human and humans had devolved in different places. Or if you're going to make them aliens, make them, like, 
completely alien aliens. Like, that's one of the weird things about the orcs, right? Is that the orcs have, like, the potential to be one of the most craziest, hilarious, and also horrifying races in all of, like, science fiction literature. Mm -hmm. Um, But because they were constructed as a Cockney parody, they end up doing very humanoid things that, like, a half-fungus creature probably wouldn't. I don't know, I just feel like you could do a lot more with them. And they're kind of hindered by the fact that they have to be orcs in space. Mm-hmm. It, it's one of those, it's like so many other things where you look at like superhero comics, right? And it's like, oh, there's a lot of potential you could go with a, a character like Batman. But because it's Batman and there's specific things about him, you're kind of constrained into yeah. the Batman, the existing mythos. Yeah, it, it, it's sometimes having a congruency in the story can hamper the the amount of evolution you can do yeah so again it's, it's one of those things fun fun to visit not necessarily something I'd want to spend a whole lot of time on but mm. I certainly enjoyed learning about it oh yeah yeah it was definitely a it, it was a more fun educational situation than other books that we have read Spring snow oh <laughs> you're just never gonna forgive me for that that was you? my birthday man <laughs> ah. All right, so en- enough about the 40K universe. Uh, Zero also asked us what we think about the Song of Serenade. That was a super fascinating concept for me. Just because it was this mathematic uh, song that in- ingrained itself in not just like culture and people would hear it and be like, oh, so this is how a song should be. It was in like the geography and the like bio- biology of the nature. It of was that. ingrained so much into the planet that like everything just sort of was themed around it in a very subtle way. Even even that like that stuff themes cool, but I'm talking about like the fact that it etched itself into their bones and that like <laughs> that like biological creatures grew up. And like the like crustaceans, their shells had like the same kind of patterns that the song would have, yeah. or the mathematic equation would have, and being like, "Holy crap!" The complexity that a simple sound wave, or at least as it, long as it's just being you know repeated over and over for billions of years, that how much it would affect biology on top of like because if it's hard to connect biology and mathematics together and culture and everything. Again, it, it, it's another example of, like, I really like the idea in, in premise. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just feel like it probably could have been... I would I would like to see a story all about that instead of it just being, like, a side thing that's like, oh, hey, and here's a neat little idea just thrown in. It, it sounds like it'd be a great start to a somewhat Lovecraftian because it reminds me a little bit of, like, the color of space. Yeah. Where it's just like... Like the ever-repeating number that's found in everything and you find out that life is all kind of, like based or influenced by this number Mm -hmm. and just having to wrap your brain around the fact that uh like like the number creates life or at least shapes life and like holy crap or it's just like and the the idea that like different cultures rise and fall over thousands of years and despite being completely different species they have this same song Mm -hmm. which is based off the repeating mathematic formula the sort of like sound wave the like three two one one three two one one just like over and over again also i'd like to state that this is one of the rarest occasions in this podcast because usually i get the audio things (laughs) and you with your 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 music magic that you have uh know how what a uh whatever the numbers are what that rhythm would sound like i was just at least have an idea of it i was never able to like fathom that picture but i I understood how like the pulsing uh sound waves would affect yeah how it would work over and over again that is actually one of my complaints with the song of serenade was that you put it in a book and you they tried their best to describe like what it is in terms of like a repeating number sequence and Mm. the the you know how like you know, at, at the end of the day, music is mathematical, right? It's mm-hmm. rhythm and beats in proportion to each other. Um, it goes back to, like, the ancient Greek idea of, like, notes being strings of different length and that affecting the pitch. Um, but I just feel like most people don't have the musical background to, like, understand that. You can't see it, but I'm pointing to myself right now. <laughs> it's not just you. It's I feel like most people... 
trying to describe a song in a book is like one of the few things where books just kind of break down when it comes well, no, to I songs. I don't know if like describing a song, describing a song mathematically, yeah. <laughs> that's where it breaks down for me. Like if you were like, it was a lilting tune that sounded as if it were a sad, like if you described it with like a sad man's lullaby to his dying child or something, I'd be like, I can exp- I can picture that. A little bit, but it's still... Like, if you're going to be like, I'm going to break down music into numbers, I'll be like, you have done two things. You have infer- you have shown my ignorance, and you have shown my inability to do music. <laughs> I am upset with you, sir. I'm just reminded of an old uh, Atop the Fourth Wall from back in the day when I used to watch Linkara, where he reviewed some some comic book about like a musical artist who became, like, a superhero. And he's like, the problem with writing a comic book about songs is that I can't hear the songs! Yes. You can write out the lyrics, you can try to use the art to convey something, but that's one of the big advantages that something like a movie has, is Mm -hmm. you have audio. Um, So trying to write a text story about a song is like... You're always going to be on your back foot. It's very, very difficult to get that far into it. But uh, for what they did, they tried. Yeah, no. They I, did a pretty good idea. Uh, uh, the idea is fascinating. I'd like to see like a, even like a short, again, like a, a short Lovecraftian like horror movie about it or something. Yeah, yeah. Because it, again, it, it seems to lean very heavily into I that. I think I'd be here. I'll give, give you the, this idea, right? Is uh, humans leave, leave Earth finally and start building colonies on like Mars or the moon. And then after like two months, they all go insane. And then you turn out that it's because there is some sort of pulsing beat within the Earth. And humans are so used to it that the silence of it drives them mad. So that they can't leave Earth without having some like this beat pulsing in their brains. And we're not even aware of it because everything on Earth has it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and maybe, I don't know, it's caused by a squid monster. Mine was more of a like a, an event horizon moment. Yeah. Where, like, these uh, far advanced humans are, ser- are are floating out in space towards uh, a, a cycling distress beacon. And they keep coming closer and closer to it. And then once they find it and they open up the thing that it has in there, they the beat just suddenly opens something in their mind. And they they go mad because of they see the... It's like, I see the holes in the Matrix type thing. Where, like, you start seeing, like, the, the music was the core of life type thing. And the important part is that people go mad. Yes. Yeah. Really, what also, we really com- want your characters to do is we want them to go crazy. <laughs> comment in the comments. Whose story sounds like it would make a better better movie? Mm-hmm. I think mine. I think his as well. <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> There's no rivalry. You've got to have... Oh, whatever. Mm, I don't do rivalries, and you know it. Anyway, moving on to the next part. Those were the only two things that Zero wanted us to talk, so hopefully and, it was worth the money, buddy. And again... Thank you, Zero. Yeah, uh, comment I and uh, I'm sure they'll comment. Well, not just comment, not, not just comment. Like more people from Patreon, Patreon, like request. Bra- like, Brandon really wants to, to do the podcast again, so the more you can request it, because we don't make very we don't make any money off this. I think I made like two dollars all year or something. I just enjoy the idea of having a project like this, and it's real nice. So it's it's fun to get together and do stuff. Mm-hmm. But yeah, moving on to the next point we had written here, which you already covered a little bit. Um, is the unique use of time oh, in this yeah. book. Because it's set over the course of, like, I think 20,000 years, mm-hmm. it, it's technically not a 40K book. It's a 20K book that eventually gets up to 40K by the end. And even, like, discussing that before with the spoilers that I was saying, it doesn't even get to my favorite part of the time. Like, yeah, the whole eternity and how long people live in that. Yeah. It's... The uh, clever, not so much clever, but the subtle, even subtle is a bit useful, uh, useless on that. The blatant use of time loops. Yeah. Like, uh, one character can, like, rewind his his consciousness, and it's so fun to watch him use it in rapid succession. Because, the whole trial scene. Oh, God, the trial scene's so funny just because... Where they keep going back and picking different jurors because they keep not working out, so he just rewinds time and it, tries it again. It's just like Groundhog's Day with aliens, and <laughs> it's so fun. <laughs> that on top of the fact that, again, he's like, hmm, I need to learn more about this. I'm going to go do some research. And then because he doesn't have to eat or sleep or do anything, and because time means nothing, he's like, and then he spent a thousand years study like in the library... <laughs> My favorite just reading books. My favorite thing is uh, about the Necrons. This isn't so much a time thing. Is that like, 
uh, they're like, all right, let's all get comfortable. Locks knees. Yeah. And they're not like, we're all like, oh, yeah, we need to sit down. They're like, nope, we don't have to worry about that. Yep. Just lock the knees. I remember that they're like on the ships and they're like, the orcs are sending like orcs with missiles on their backs are flying into the ship. And like, do orcs need air to breathe? I don't know. <laughs> we don't. We don't. I mean, usually that stops borders. We don't really have any anti-boarding stuff because normally people can't get over here because we don't have oxygen mm-hmm. or heat or anything. There's no point. The ships, the ship designs can be almost like whatever based entirely on practicality because you just put a Necron head as the pilot and just place it wherever. You could actually, yeah, basically do what the the orcs do and just like put an engine at the end of a hunk of metal and just have them flying somewhere. Yeah. But the, they're... they're call, Calling the orcs engines engines is yeah, kind of... Fair point, but I'm just saying, like, the simplistic design. Just a pile of twigs and leaves and stuff, and yeah. they wrote the word engine on it. And they painted it red. They painted so it red. So it went fast. Because it makes it go fast. They painted it purple, which means it's invisible. Did you know that? Yes. It's one of those things I learned after the fact. It's one of my favorite, like, uh, like 40K stories. Or not 40K, but, like, the the... Warhammer game stories ever heard is that somebody rolled the equivalent of a natural 20 on a perception check and the DM was like you see a poor a, uh, an orc running at you covered in purple I'm like just <laughs> like that's not a good thing no that's I guess for people who don't know or people just like hearing this part but um, one of the, they don't explain it super well in this book but orcs essentially have reality bending magic that they're unaware of. And it works more powerfully if they're in groups. And the orcs are very dumb. So literally, if they they paint their ship red, they believe that'll make it go faster. And because you have a bunch of orcs together, it actually makes it go faster. So all their technology is literally clumps of metal that have just been, like, hammered together by a guy that everyone thinks is smart. And because they think his inventions are smart, they work. And that's the terrifying thing about orcs. Isn't so much that they are big brutal machines that destroy whatever it's the fact that whatever they believe becomes reality yeah I, and I, they're <laughs> dumb enough that you can make them believe anything I, there, there's a very famous story you can find an animation of it i forget if i sent it to you it did talking not. about the there's a bunch of space marines hunkered down and they're fighting wave after wave of orcs and their their ammunition is getting lower and lower and finally, the lead marine, without knowing what to do, just points his empty gun at an orc and goes, BANG! And the orc drops over dead. <laughs> so they spend the next hour just like, BANG! BANG! And the orcs just explode and die out. <laughs> because they believe that the bullets still, that the guns still have bullets in it. They're like, all the orcs are dead. And then over the ridge, there's like a bunch of six orcs all grouped together, coming over the hill. And they start going, BANG! BANG! And all you hear from the orcs is, patoo, patoo, patoo. They're like, what the hell? And then as they get o- closer, they can hear this chanting. All the orcs together going, I'm a tank, I'm a tank, I'm a tank, I'm a tank. <laughs> that is both hilarious, and if it were happening to you, the most scary thing you will ever experience. Uh, and I, I've heard the story goes on. It's like they throw a rock at it. They like blocks off. They're like, no, that's a grenade. And they like argue with the orcs over whether or not it's a grenade. <laughs> And then the rock eventually explodes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. That, that's why we say that orcs are clown shoes. Orcs are clown shoes. It's they, Frightening, frightening clown shoes. You know, you, you have psychics and cyborgs and people riding giant dinosaurs. And, and it's genetically... silly, but it seems kind of like, okay, I can get this. They're using magic and science. And then the orcs come in and everything's just thrown out the window. I also want to postulate genetically created godchildren. Yeah. Um... Like, the, just the, the the Primarchs. They're just like, we were just genetically created from a god emperor that just, like, okay. You know, no big deal. Super metal stuff. And then you're the orcs are over here just being like, we believe this red go fast. Yeah. <laughs> and again, it, it's not even just that. It's the fact that, like, they, they have reality warping powers. They reproduce by being murdered. They grow from spores. So if they get on your planet... You pretty much just have to burn the entire planet down. Because they're just going to, like, you can kill them all, but new ones will just pop up in a couple years. Crack the planet. Crack it. Crack the planet. There's nothing you could do. Nope. nope. It's like if you find a Necron tomb world. Like, yeah, crack the planet. That's it. They're done. Just get rid of it. (laughs) That is kind of the human's, like, final resort. Like, up, up, crack it. Yep. 
It's one of those things, like, again, I, I love the concept. I would like to see a more serious thing try to deal with, like, how do you do with this alien race that just, like, swarms over everything, literally like a moving fungus that can build spaceships. I feel like if you took the human perspective, it wouldn't be funny. <laughs> Not at all. But that's the thing, is, like, I don't feel like this was, they came up with this super serious concept, and then, like, we need to make it funny. I think they started with Cockney Orcs and worked backwards from there. Yeah. They're like, there's some... It was like they looked at a, a, a picture of the war universe and they saw, like, dark, dark, uh, dark. And then they saw, like, the orcs was this big, green, goofy thing with clown shoes on. They're like, gosh, we have to make this scarier. Um, we, we, it, it's one of those things where someone just had the idea of, like, you know, orcs in a cobbled together, like, big metal truck with a trebuchet on back and chain guns. And they're like... How do we explain how this works? <laughs> how did something so stupid make something that can stand up against anything? And then you see the guy in the in the uh, the the writers room stand up and go, "We don't." Yeah, I'm I'm reminded of the the uh, Superman has tactile telekinesis thing. Ah, uh, it's one of my favorite uh, ones. Yeah, where they're like, "You can't pick up a car like that the car. If you put that much pressure on one point, it would just bend in half." And they're like, mm. "No, no, no! Superman has telekinesis, but he has to be touching it first. That's why when he pushes on the train, he stops the train instead of having the train just, like, bend around him as it would if you put, like, a pole in the middle of it. Yeah. Admittedly, I really like that superpower because it's, <laughs> it's a fascinating superpower, really. It's but, a fascinating superpower. It's just, you know they didn't come up with that originally. Oh, no, no, no. They no. just didn't understand physics and then later people tried to explain it. <laughs> and that's that moment where you're like, oh, crap, I haven't been reading enough. Yeah. Um, but we have gotten off topic. That's enough about the sci-fi of here. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, kind of briefly, is the, the whole Wheel of Time ending. Because I don't know if it's just me, if I've got Wheel of Time on the brain. I mean, obviously you do too. This is more of a question for you, you, uh, you listeners out there who maybe haven't read Wheel of Time. But, uh, I just feel like they hearkened really hard onto that near the end, where they talked about, you know, that... To be fair, it has kind of been a theme of this novel because uh, the Necrons live for eternity. You get to see the rise and fall of civilizations. Mm -hmm. They're talking about like, oh, our own civilization fell. It starts with the Aldari. They just corrupted the FTL pathways. It's destroyed their civilization. They're on the, the, the downswing and people are like... Happy birthday, Slanesh. Yeah. They're like, oh, I hear that these, uh, these humans are starting to explore space. I wonder what will happen to them. But yeah, that's kind of how they wrap things up in the feud between the infinite and the divine, is that they both kind of come to this realization that, you know, life is just one great big circle. Things rise and they fall, but they may rise again. So even though they're at the, the bottom of their turning right now, the wheel of time is going to keep turning, and eventually they'll rise again as long as they're persistent. And because they're immortal, they can afford to be persistent. I feel like it's also a bit of them just trying to not look like an idiot as most of what they did was idiotic in the yeah. entire story. <laughs> At the end of the story, it's like, wow, that sure was one hell of a fight. Um, we're called the Infinite and the Divine, so I guess we should say something that tries to be a little pretentious, you know. Just mm -hmm. <laughs> while, while at the back of their mind, they're just like, dick. This <laughs> bitch well, and they're it, just like pointing it, at each other i guess that's what one of the things that i'm curious about especially to other readers because i feel like if you haven't read a whole lot of books or if you specifically haven't read the wheel of time which deals with that theme very intimately over like 15 books mm -hmm. it's sort of weird to see like oh and here's the the same theme trying to be explained in like five pages mm -hmm. and not doing it justice in my opinion but it's like, if that was your first book or whatever, maybe that really spoke to you. Maybe that, that really hit you somewhere. Please don't read this book and think that the Wheel of Time stole it. <laughs> I mean, that, that is another thing, too, is, um, you know, the, the idea of circles and circular history isn't exactly a new idea. It's, it's not been like around Wheel of Time. for a while. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Fuck it. Get out, of, get out of here. God, I don't want to do <laughs> Bring it around into this. <laughs> But yeah, this secular history, secular storytelling has been around since the dawn of time. Mm -hmm. There is nothing new under the sun, which is a quote from the Bible. Yes. <laughs> Back then they were like, eh, there's nothing new. Everything is just repeating over and over again. You know how it is. Yep. So, yeah, it's not exactly a Wheel of Time thing. It's just interesting to see this, like, 
Because they use the imagery of wheels and circles at the end very um, heavily. heavily. Even though they've never talked about them ever before. Yeah. This, it's like, it's like, and then Trazen picked up this book called The Wheel of Time. And then yes. he was like, that's right. Human literature. How interesting. <laughs> this <laughs> life is a cycle. This is how Trazen talks, right? <laughs> no. Hello, everyone. I am the infinite. I will archive everything. Oh, God, no. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, moving on. Uh, speaking of the characters, I mean, one thing that you wanted to talk about, and I guess this kind of is a, is a good point for me. I'm just not sure exactly what there is to say about it, other than it's very excellent writing on Robert Rath's part that he could make two characters who are unabashed assholes. Oh, yeah. And also not human and don't have, like, really human motivations. I mean, they're kind of, like I said at the beginning, you know, they're close enough to humans that you can understand where they're coming from. But they're also very disconnected from, like, any kind of motivations that most of us have. And mm -hmm. yet, somehow, those characters are likable. You enjoy the time you spend with Trazim and Oricon, is it? Uh, Orican. Uh, Orican and uh, Trazim, yeah, they are just... The worst kind of people and have some... You could never really fathom how they would live their lives. But you do get these little inserts into them that kind of tie you together. Or maybe give you this feeling that you can understand them. Like Trazin's interest in the arts and his sentiment, sentimentality with the things that he tries to archive. And then Orican over here with, yeah, his look to the future. But really... The thing that like grounded me the most for him was his subtle relationship he was trying to that he was basically having with Fashani. Yeah, like you like the idea that they they shoehorned like a kind of romance plot into here. Yeah, with these things that are so very uh, alien and everything, they somehow gave us a romance. And they I, don't have hearts or sex organs, and yet they have romance. And yet the they have sexes field. too, but that's something yeah. for later. Um, but yeah, like it's it's the romance felt for lack of a better term, organic. It, uh, it was more well-developed than, like, most romances you see in traditional things. And again, it's, it's barely like a romance. It starts more as, like, a mutual respect between two scholars. Um, and then they make a note of, like, well, you know, he's studying her work so in-depthly over so many thousands of years, and his neural pathways are so complicated that parts of her, like, soul and essence get embedded into his mind so they can communicate even though she died 10,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Although then you find out she didn't actually die and she's kind of alive. And she also does actually kind of reciprocate the feelings you get from that. Yeah. Um, it's what does he call her? My equal. My equal. Yeah. She calls him my equal as he is also, he reveres her throughout the entire, yeah. he, lo uh, he louds her the entire time of like, oh, she's such this brilliant thing and admittedly, that uh, the more you hear my equal, it's very much like a uh, spoiler, obviously, but uh, the uh, something that the deceiver is using to hook him in. Yeah. And once that happened, once it's revealed that it was a, uh, a ploy from this ancient evil God, um, it kind of is relieving when she, uh, the head of her rolls back and says, Orican run. Yeah. Where you're just like, Oh, she... There was still some section of her that is, like, you know... The Deceiver was moving or acting through her, but still using her neural pathways and stuff. Mm -hmm. And again, because, you know, so much of what was in him was her works and everything. Mm -hmm. And again, it's one of these neat science fiction concepts where it's like, if you really had 20,000 years to study someone, could you know them so well that they might as well, like, exist? Could you have so much information about them that you essentially have them in your head? Yeah, like you would have a ghost in the shell of your of someone else that you have been studying. It's yeah. Pretty fascinating stuff. And again, it's one of my little favorite things about this book is just in this story of two juvenile immortals. You uh, can still have a Pokemon. personal relationship like that. Yeah. There's still the rivalry between them that starts off very childish, but later on when they start working together, it's just like... Oh, that's kind of adorable. Yeah, it's adorable, and you also realize you two are idiots. You'd work uh, fantastically together. Yeah. If you would get out of your own fucking ways here. Like like so many problems in life, if people just work together instead of working against each other, they could, they could accomplish so much. Mm, and they did. They, they killed a god. Yeah. 
It wasn't. They had a lot of help. They had to bring in like orcs and humans, and it's really weird. I understand when the orcs come out and they're just like, "Yes, more fighting, fight whatever." But then the humans come out and they're like, "I don't know what's going on, but I know orders when I see them." Like, are they really that dumb? No, it's they got the scarabs. They talk about the scarabs earlier on. They're basically mind control bugs. They, they, uh, I thought he put all the humans in a... He, like, froze them in the battle. I didn't know he had time to put the scarabs and have them go to work on them. That battle was probably, like, 200 years ago. He had more than enough time. I guess. Yeah, like, he's very much, like, everything that he puts in there that he can, I think he puts scarabs. Yeah. And then the Aldari are just like, we're for the greater good, kind of, anyway. I love the Aldori just, like, pops out and already knows what's going on because, like, I foresaw this. I told I you. I foresaw this 20,000 years ago. I said we'd meet again. And Don't now, fuck it up this time. And now my friends and I are going to die for this. Yeah, don't fuck it up. Yeah. <laughs> don't fuck it up this time, buddy. Mm-hmm. You already didn't heed my warning, which, I mean, I guess I could tell the future, so I should have known that it wouldn't work anyway, but I still gotta try. Yeah. But, yeah, I think that's that's just about everything we had to say about this. It's it's not the longest episode, but this is a, the longest book, as we said. And it's also not the most complicated book. Despite the fact that they did manage to fit in, again, a lot of interesting ideas, a lot of this text is taken up with fight scenes. Oh, yeah. I think the last fourth of it is almost entirely, like the one big fight scene where he lets everything out of the archive and they're just like, everyone's there. And you do kind of get this very much like on your left moment from like Infinity War. Yeah. Where it's just like, and everyone's there. And they all came out. They use the archive spheres. Mm -hmm. Though I will say that this is actually the longest book we've ever read. Because it takes 20,000 years. That's, you're gonna make me kick you out again. And you already, you already had to come back. You already had to, to, to pay me off and everything. And this all happened off camera, but now it's happening on camera. I was gone for five years. <laughs> yep, it's, it's been a long time. That's why it took so long. We actually filmed this back in 2015. This was the first episode of Legs Talk About Books, and we've just had these long, long time. Yeah, you know, <laughs> this we, joke is going longer than the book is. Yeah, this book is longer and more aged than the Necron race. <laughs> Let me tell you what. Uh, but yeah, that's that's about it. Uh, like again, overall thoughts, pretty nice book. Pretty yeah, it's, fun. It's a pretty fun, uh, I would say it's a fun book to dip your toes into the uh, Warhammer universe. I think we stated that already. Yeah, but... not really going to change your life or anything. No. I... And this is normally where we tell people like subscribe, check out next month, but uh, we don't really know when we're going to be doing this again. If you want to do more, yeah, Patreon him and tell him to do yeah, another that's, one. that's always the option. Uh, we will probably bring this back in 2023. Yes. Because <laughs> we are on a Necron time scale. Yeah, we... Next episode is probably next year sometime if we get around it. Uh, but that's because we are definitely doing... Uh, the Brandon Sanderson 4. Yeah. Um, I, I guess we haven't mentioned this on the channel, so this would be a good opportunity to bring this up. Mm -hmm. If you missed it, Brandon Sanderson, who's probably one of the biggest science fiction writers of the last like 50 years. Oh, yeah. Maybe one of the most prolific writers. He's coming up on Stephen King. Yeah, he's, he's like definitely... almost written more than he has, which and, is a lot. And on less cocaine. He had a Kickstarter in 2021, I believe, was when a, it actually went through. He had a bumper crop in 2020. Yeah, where he had written four novels um, without telling his producer, not a producer, his editors or anything. He just did them for fun during the COVID pandemic because he had nothing. He couldn't go on his speaking tours and stuff. So he wrote four novels, and then he kickstarted them to get them uh, self-published, so he could just get them and send them out. And some of them looked interesting. Uh, there's one in particular that's like a young man's guide to magic. Yeah. And the cover's got a picture of like a wizard with a gun. And I'm like, that that seems interesting. That's gonna be the one I want to read but the most. Me, me and Brandon both backed the Kickstarter, mm -hmm. so we will be getting all four books. They're all coming out in 2023. I got the audiobooks. He's gonna get the physical. They're releasing them, I believe, one every three months mm -hmm. over the course of that year. And we're probably gonna review all four, unless like the first two suck or something. Yeah. Hard to say, hard to leg, but. If you're interested at all in getting in on that, I mean, it's probably too late to tell people to back the Kickstarter. I think yeah. it's long gone. Oh, yeah, it's definitely been but long gone. But I, I imagine that the books, after they come out, you'll be able to get them online or whatever or find some other way. I'm still just floored by, like, the idea of, like, yeah, I'm struggling to write a book. Brandon Sanderson wrote four of them yeah. during quarantine. <laughs> I just love that he just gets a big pile of papers. 
I was bored, so I wrote a book. You all want it? And then he just like, oh yeah, I forgot. Doof. And Doof. that was so fun. I just wrote a second one. And, and a the third, third one. one. And then I polished it off with a fourth one. Yeah, man. It's... The but first yeah. one was apparently a gift to his wife. He was just like, you like my writing, right, honey? Yeah, I'll write <laughs> you your own little book. Wow. Exciting. So yeah, you can look forward to that. Maybe something else in between that. Maybe we'll review Wheel of Time Season 2 at some point. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Those did even worse than the uh, podcast. Yeah, that was that. Unfortunately, went... it might have also been that the show didn't exactly you know... light the world on fire. Did you know they're making more uh, animated ones? Yeah, yeah cool. I think those are already out too. Nice. Yeah. Either way, we've rambled on enough. Thank you again, zero fifteen oh three. Thank you, Robert Rath, for writing a book. Even though you'll probably never listen to this. Yeah. And until next time. Good luck. Keep reading. You're, you're supposed to know this. You I were the one we were who gonna, came up with it. I thought it was good luck and keep reading. No, it was just until next time, keep reading. Well, keep reading, everybody.